the B-29 was the B-32 program, uh, the Dominator. And uh, Bill, unfortunately, uh, was in a takeoff accident in that airplane that caused several deaths, but as you can see, he survived quite well. Uh, he uh, was with the company for, what, 30-some years, Bill? Yeah, 32 years. And uh, he uh, is familiar with all of the programs uh, of that company, which is, uh, there's a lot of history in that. He's a, he's a member of the Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, he's a member of uh, whatever we call IAS these days, AIAA, I guess. And uh, he's, uh, uh, let's see, uh, he's also one of the, one of the people there who became a fellow in the uh, uh, AIAA, which, uh, which again, as I say, is, uh, I know is an IAS, Institute of Aeronautical Sciences, but I believe AIAA now stands for uh, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. Is that correct, Bill? Okay, I got it right. Um, he uh, <coughs> does several uh, seminars besides the Tripidian, obviously, and uh, uh, one of the one of the programs that he was associated with, which he initiated himself along with uh, another flight test engineer down there named Ken Howard, uh, was the uh, uh, there was the Wee Bee and the uh, the Honey Bee and uh, let's see what was the third one. We Queen Bee, right? That was the most place. The, I saw the uh, uh, Wee Bee fly in the late '40s at the National Air Races at Cleveland. And were you the one that flew it, Bill? Well, I, I was there, but Carl Monaco flew it. There. Carl Monaco. Well, anyway, that was a very small airplane in which the pilot laid down on the fuselage, and his feet moved rudders that were aft, and his hands uh, operated the controls forward. And it was uh, as close to a motorcycle type airplane as ever existed. And uh, what size engine did that have? 30 horsepower. Yeah, you know, 30 horsepower. So it got around pretty good. It, it, it was interesting to see that thing fly. It wasn't a kamikaze, was it? <laughs> <laughs> it, it could have been a kamikaze. Uh, he, one of his uh, later programs, uh, which uh, we would like to have been able to, to uh, have scheduled it here, was the high-speed pistol tilt wing aircraft. Uh, a lot of you are familiar with tilt wing and tilt engine concepts that are being proposed for the Marine Corps and for uh, tactical uh, 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 military operations, and Bill has done a lot of work in that area on uh, the tilt wing, which is somewhat more efficient than the tilt engine and uh, has a lot of advantages. But I think we want to hear about the Tripibian, so let me have Bill come forward and tell you what you'd really like to hear. Okay. Mm -hmm. I appreciate being invited here. That's the finest introduction I've had today. <laughs> uh, I did work 32 years for Convair, and uh, not only is the time wrong on uh, when we're supposed to start this, but it, this project that I'm going to show you, the Tripibian, has nothing to do with Convair, by the way. It's a ROAR, it was a ROAR program, ROAR Industries. Uh, shortly after, thir after 32 years with Convair, I got enticed by a real good friend of mine, Walt Mooney, to go over to ROAR to work on a special project, which was the dream of the, of the chairman of the board of ROAR, Burt Raines. And, uh, his dream was to have an airplane, uh, an airplane with far advanced technology. And uh, it was going to be a small airplane. It wasn't a military fighter or anything like that. It was just a two-place airplane, which we figured someday would grow to a four-place airplane. But he wanted advanced technology, and he wanted, uh, and he wanted a triphibian. So when Walt Mooney saw what was starting to surface there, since he and I had played around quite a bit with the Convair Sea Dart, uh, which was a ski-operated uh, uh, high speed. In fact, the only seaplane that ever went supersonic was a Sea Dart. And uh, so, since we played with that during the Sea Dart days, uh, he said, you better get on over here 
and start working with us on this trifibian. So the trifibian never had any publicity at all, period. Uh, I've only given this talk twice before, one to the Experimental Aircraft Association in San Diego and one to uh, another group. I can't remember which one of those now. But, uh, uh, so this is the third time it's given and you've never seen any pictures of this airplane. There was never any publicity. It was never in any, any magazines. And uh, we took that tack down there uh, primarily because Burt Raines wanted to surprise the world with this great super airplane. Uh, there were a lot of innovative things in this airplane. In, in fact, I, I, I consider it a, a great uh, education to have, been, to have worked on this airplane. Uh, it, had, uh, it was started out as a, it was a delta wing airplane. It had ducted fan. It was 100% composites. It was uh, two place. Uh, 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 it was supposed to have a turbine engine but we actually flew it with a reciprocating engine, the first, and, uh, and we, so we designed it, and we built it, and we flew it twice uh, in the 1974-75 uh, uh, time period, and uh, it was relatively successful, but uh, when you add it all up, when you add it all up, uh, it probably would not have been a good two-place airplane because of the complexity you get with everything I just mentioned. Uh, you have to remember this is 20 years ago now. It was 20 years ago that we did this. So it was a great education program for me, uh, and I learned an awful lot from that. Uh, but for the practicality of this airplane, to, to replace airplanes like Cessna 152 or Cessna 172s, uh, it was not too practical. It was meant to be mass produced, really mass produced. It was 100% polystyrene foam. And now I don't know if you're familiar with polystyrene foam. There's, a, there's also a polyurethane foam that a lot of the home builds are made up these days. And polyurethane is really good stuff. It's, you can't get it down to less than about two pounds per cubic foot. But polystyrene, you can get down to a one pound per cubic foot. And that's we, this airplane was all polystyrene. <coughs> There's only one thing wrong with polystyrene, and that is if you pour gasoline on it, it disappears. <laughs> so, so any, yeah, yeah. which isn't true of polyurethane, by the way. So, poly, so that any polystyrene uh, airplane that's got any polystyrene in it has to be encapsulated in the uh, fiberglass so that fuel can never get to the polystyrene. So I think we'd have had a hard time convincing the FAA uh, on this airplane because they'd say, well, you know, that you're going to get a pinhole in there and somebody's going to stop, put gasoline in there and you'll never even know this disappeared because the, <laughs> well, because the fiberglass would hold up but the polystyrene would disappear and so you'd have a mess. Anyway, I want to uh, tell you about this airplane. Uh, it's a trifibian. What I'm going to do is show you a group of slides and then I've got a, a, a videotape of the actual airplane on, on the runway flights that we made and some uh, flights where we, we had a Cessna that we uh, ran a, a runaway start, you know, to see which one could accelerate the fastest and you'll see some of that. And, and then I end up with a, a movie that was uh, made of a small, relatively small model, in fact it was quite small, only about that big, uh, of a hydrodynamic test model that we towed all around Mission Bay and measured the hydrodynamic characteristics of what this airplane would have been uh, with, with its skis installed. The airplane that we actually flew twice uh, did not have skis on it, but we were working towards and going in that direction of having skis. And so you'll see pictures of that model and some of the hydrodynamic tests that were made with that model. Uh, we call this airplane all kind of things. Uh, my title is 71X, uh, which is one of the things that it was called, then it was called the 2175, and, uh, uh, but what we were going to call it, if it ever went into production, was going to be the Quiet Roar. <laughs> but, uh, that, was our, that was what we were going to call it. So let me turn this slide projector on, and we're going to leave the lights, I think, right where they are, because uh, I don't want it too dark in here. I like to see if anybody's sleeping. Right in your way, aren't I? I'll get over here. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, Roar, you see, was in all kinds of diversified programs, and so this is one of their first airplane programs. <laughs> Well, we can try it. Want to turn the lights down? Uh, it'll be. It, you can't go any lower without getting off. Uh, so, uh, they're over here. But, uh, if you promise me you won't go to sleep. Oh, that's great. Okay. All right. Yeah. Aurora was in that all forms of diversified program, which uh, some of you may remember that in the late '60s and early '70s, that was the thing to do. All the aerospace companies were told. Okay, you guys, there may, there's not very much aerospace these days, so get into all, the, all these other things, trains and buses and trams and, and uh, anything else besides what you've been doing all your life. Well, Roar uh, did that. I mean, Burt Reigns really picked, uh, bit the hook on that. And, uh, you know, in the early 70s, Roar was building BART cars for San Francisco. They were beginning to build cars, and they, they did build quite a few cars for the WMATA, which was the Washington Metro. They built buses, and uh, new buses, and uh, a jet engine, they had a jet engine program, and they were just into all kind of things. The maglev uh, trains, uh, they were in everything. But then they got into some financial troubles, and in uh, 1975, 76 time period, they finally had to say, we're not going to continue with any of these things, we've got to get back to our basic product line, which at Roar Industries was the building of nacelles for all of the transports and military and commercial uh, aircraft they were building nacelles. So this was the, we always start this out with this bus about to take off uh, and call it our aircraft program. Here are some artist sketches of the airplane before the airplane that was ever actually flown uh, or even fully designed. This is a, shows taking off of, of land. Uh, here it shows taking off the water. Uh, here it shows uh, taking off of snow. Dreamers, huh? Uh, and then here it shows it with the wings folded inside of a garage. And so this airplane was supposed to do everything. And uh, <coughs> we did get... Uh, and then here's a picture of it alongside a Cessna 152, so you get an idea of the size of this airplane. It was two place, just like the Cessna... 152, except it had a, our airplane had only a 20 foot wingspan. And it had a delta wing. Now here's a picture of the actual airplane alongside an actual 7 to 152. Here's a picture of the airplane out at our, our uh, secret. We had a, basically we had a small skunk works, by the way, at, at Roar. That's what we really had. There were only 12 of us in the whole, whole involvement with this airplane. That included four or five shop people, the rest of us engineers, and we, and we, uh, uh, and the engineers were also pilots. The fellow that actually flew the airplane was one of the engineers on the, on the board. And uh, is that in focus? No. Okay. No. Oh. That's better. Huh? Good. Okay. So. This is uh, out in El Centro, where we would take the airplane and flew it. And by the way, we were operating in 105, 110 degree weather, and never had any trouble with the airplane uh, as far as cooling was concerned, and it had a buried uh, four-cylinder Lycoming engine. Uh, here's a takeoff <coughs> shot. Yes, here's a couple of shots in the air. Uh, the pilot took it up to 6,000 feet on the first flight, which was against my wishes. My a flight test experience tells me that on the first flight of any airplane, particularly a light airplane, and it's a new one, it hasn't been proven before, you better just go to 2,000 feet, fly around for a little while, and hurry up and come home so that you can tell if there's anything that has gone wrong. Uh, we did have a problem on, on this flight after you got to 6,000 feet. We had a shaft problem and the airplane started to vibrate and then you had a problem getting down. Because, you know, on a, with a Delta wing in the first place you can't get too slow and, uh, and get the drag too high. And then with the, since it's the first flight you can't go real fast because you don't know how it's going to act at coming down fast. So you have a tr trouble getting down from 6,000 feet if you've got a problem.
Uh, you'll notice that here, there's nothing in the back here other, other than the propeller. The first flight, we flew it without what we call a, a stator, stator vanes in the back. And then uh, and, uh, the airplane only had 800 feet a minute rate of climb without the stator vanes. Uh, it had a, uh, we were running the Lycoming at 4,000 RPM, which was the proper speed for the ducted fan. Uh, but then on the second flight, we put the stator vanes in and we jumped from 800 feet a minute rate of climb to 1,800 feet a minute rate of climb. That's how much difference it could make. It also had a fixed landing gear, which was unfortunate because this is supposed to be a modern airplane and yet it had a uh, fixed, uh, fixed gear. Uh, actually, when you see the pictures of the model, our, our production airplane was going to have a retractable landing gear. coming in for landing. Incidentally, since Chuck Yeager was an experienced Delta wingman, he flew the XF-92 for the Air Force, and I, I, and I was on that program. I got to know him pretty well. So before we flew this airplane, we invited him down, and he came down from Edwards where they were filming the, the, the right stuff and uh, spent a day with us and convinced our pilot that was going to fly this airplane that it looked like it was going to be flying okay. So, and the pilot never had any trouble with this airplane at all. It, it had elevons on the back, uh, just like the other Delta Wing airplanes, uh, pursuit uh, fighter airplanes have. But uh, it, it, he had no problem flying the airplane. What kind of speeds you talking about? Well, the airplane with uh, this power that we had, uh, see, we had 150 horsepower live combing, which we were running at 4,000 RPM, so we were getting probably more than 150 horsepower out of it. And uh, uh, we've never had this airplane over 100 miles an hour. Because like I said, there were only two flights. Uh, and that's, again, without the stators, you see. You see the propeller, but there's no stator vanes in there. And I have a picture of the stators a little bit later. And then taxiing back. There's our brave pilot. And, this is a three view of the airplane. Here it's called a 2175. It had a 20 foot span, 22 feet long, and the wings folded. This is a mock up of the, uh, of the cockpit. It had a narrow instrument panel and small instruments, but it had all the necessary instruments for, for uh, uh, you know, uh, our IFR flying. Uh, this is a, we had a center stick. And we had, this is the trim tabs, trim, trim tab control. Uh, when, when you have a, a, a elevons like that, or if you have a V tail, you can have two knobs like this, and you operate them together, and it gives you a longitudinal trim, and you can operate them differentially, and you get uh, rudder, uh, uh, rudder trim, too. So, uh, and then here's the actual uh, airplane uh, Cockpit. From the other angle, we we did run one of the airplanes in our test area at Roar with the, with the uh, turbine engine that Roar had developed. Except the turbine engine was not a very it was it was an experimental engine, uh, and it had to have a recuperator uh, to reduce the fuel consumption. But uh, the engine plus the recuperator and all that, the, airplane, the engine was, uh, had a poorer power to weight ratio than a reciprocating engine. So you say, well, why do we want to go to a turbine engine and it dumps up all the fuel? So actually, we, we, we knew that we could not fly behind that turbine engine, although we ran it on the ground uh, in an airplane. We built two airplanes, by the way. And a third, we built a, a, a static test article, too. No rudder pedals? Yeah, there were rudder pedals. Yeah, we had a rudder on top of the thing, on top of the duct, remember? No, yeah, I took it. I actually didn't see any pedals. Just the pilot was having Well, yeah. One throttle on the left side only? No, one, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, one throttle on the left side only, yes, right. <coughs> okay, that's so a front view. There's the canopy open. Were the uh, leading edge devices on the map?
No, they weren't devices. They were just a group leading edge on the outboard, outboard span. They were group leading edges. We also had a thing that we were going to, we never flew with it, but we tested it in the wind tunnel. We had a small delta, uh, not a canard. It was just a thing that was very close to the leading edge in this area. Uh, and uh, from the wind tunnel test, we found out we could get a lot higher lift coefficients if we had that on. Like a straight? Yeah, like a straight up in front of the, it wasn't attached to the wing, it was attached to the fuselage, and it was just, but the drilling edge of that overlapped the uh, leading edge of the, of the wing. <coughs> we would have, see this hole right here? It would have, it, would, it just went in there, and it was a little delta thing that out in front. Here's uh, the way we folded the wings. The man on the right is uh, Don, uh, Don Westergren. He was also the pilot. And uh, Walt Mooney is on the left. And we had a folding wing, folding uh, vertical. This is the instrument panel. And everything was composites on this, of course, except the wheels and brakes. And we had a wooden propeller. <coughs> And this is a vertical fin. It just had that one hinge point going through a, a heavier foam uh, box bar. And uh, then you'll see the uh, cups that uh, when it was closed, you could take out the, the shear uh, because these cups fit into uh, the male cup, fit into the female cup there. And then also, actually, uh, the rudder was movable from down here, but this portion sat right in, inside that rib. So that's a close-up of that. That was the. This was the only. This was a metal, a metal hinge, uh, put together with the uh, and bonded to the fiberglass. Now here's a static test program on a static test airplane, and uh, we got up to uh, uh, 100 and uh, up to the 150 percent ultimate load test, and right at that point in time the hinge uh, attaching the wing to the fuselage failed and there's a better and th this was a fiberglass hinge by the way that we designed and built ourselves with a metal pin but the fiberglass was it was a fiberglass hinge and that failed we uh, repeated we re repaired this and straightened it and took the uh, the wing up to over 150 percent uh all of it. this is the engine installation Pure, certain, ordinary Lycoming four-cylinder with some different cams to allow it to go at 4,000 RPM. It was nicely boxed in, and uh, like I said, we had no problem with cooling, even on those very hot days, and doing a lot of taxi tests up there in El Centro. There is our one of our little problems, and that is we had a we had to have a shaft from the engine over to the propeller. And uh, on the first flight, we had a shaft failure. And fortunately, we had it set up so that if the shaft failed, it wouldn't flounder around and move the whole airplane. It was in a guarded type of uh, area. And so we uh, didn't lose the airplane, but we had some bad vibrations uh, prior to landing. You know, we I'll, I'll mention this, that, and that is that all of us that worked on this airplane, Walt Mooney, myself, Ken Coward, we all worked on these other airplanes, the Wee Bee, Honey Bee, and Queen Bee, in the earlier 1948 time period. And uh, uh, we knew Moke Taylor real well up in, the, uh, up in Washington. And Moke Taylor, of course, has built flying automobiles and almost all of his vehicles, all of his vehicles have been pushers. And he gave us one word of advice when we were up there. We went up there and paid him 200 bucks and says, we can't tell you what we're building, but we're building a pusher, and, we're, and it's going to have a shaft. And he says, I'll give you just one bit of advice. If you've got a four-cylinder engine, and you're going to put a shaft on it, he says, I don't care if it's a thin shaft, a thick shaft, a long shaft, a short shaft. No matter what kind of shaft, you better have a dynaflow coupling between the engine and the propeller. And he always used a dynaflow coupling, and, uh, uh, and, and it works for him. But when we came back, uh, the decision was made that that coupling was going to be too heavy, that we could do it with this type of an installation uh, without a dynafold coupling. I guess it's not dynafold, it's uh, 
see another picture. Now that's the big model being towed, but that's as fast as we could go. We were probably going 30, 35 miles an hour uh, out of Mission Bay, but that's as fast as we could tow it. Okay, I think that's it there. If someone knows how to flip that switch, uh, I'll show you the movies here. Four, seventy-five. That's twenty years ago. Now here's where we had a, a Cessna racehorse start, and the airplane would accelerate faster than the Cessna, but of course, as soon as he got airborne, he pulled back the throttle because he was going to land at the end of the before he got to the end of the run. No, it really wasn't. He was just nervous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the was a little nervous. <laughs> now, you, you, you forgot what I told you originally. I learned a heck of a lot from this program. <laughs> it wasn't the best airplane, but I learned a lot from this, air, from this program. Well, it's not short couple. I heard you say that. It's a pure delta, and so it's, uh, it's not short couple. Yeah. It had camber on the outer. It was a symmetrical airfoil, except the outer wing, outer portion of the wing had a had a drooped uh, uh, leading edge. <coughs> Which part of the wing stalled first on the approach? Uh, a delta wing doesn't stall. I mean, until you get up to 30, 40 degrees angle of attack. Of course, up there you got so much drag, you don't ever want to be up there. <laughs> You mentioned that the aircraft won't How did you manage to keep this thing so secret so it never, nobody ever got any wind out of it? I'll tell you a minute. Okay, here's the 20th scale uh, hydrodynamic <coughs> test model where we towed around San Diego Bay early in the morning. We had a lot of fun with this, and we learned a lot. We could try different size keys, uh, and we were measuring the, the drag, of course, so we could uh, identify the low-speed hump and the high-speed hump drag points. Now, this was for snow skis, or are you going to do it? Well, this was, these skis were supposed to work for both. I see. Yeah. So then it would float on the main airframe? Yeah, it just goes right down onto the water, onto the wing, like very much like the Convair Sea Dart. <laughs> Uh, operated. Taxi out right on the wing. Oh, yeah, we had a long pole out to the side. I think this is six. This is when I when it says six knots or twelve knots, that's the full scale speed. That's not the speed of the model. That's uh, using dynamically similar relationships. Uh, that's uh, full scale speed. Like this would be twenty knots for the full for the for the full-size airplane. We found that really once we got up on the skis, we hardly, we didn't need that forward ski. But to unport, we had to have that forward ski. Did you actually with those elevons with the radio control, is that the way you got your up? No, no, these they were fixed, ele fixed elevon runs, yeah. These were fixed elevon runs. We later on put a, a, made this a radio control model, but it was so small and the actions were so fast, it was impossible to apply it. In fact, we never got it off. We, we got it to the point where it got up to about a speed like this, and then as soon as it broke ground, being quite a distance from the operator, it would just we'd lose control of it. Did Walt build that model? No, I did. Yeah, you know, when Bert Wayne wasn't looking. <laughs> I got a typical takeoff run here, and if you timed it, it was it's 30 seconds, which would be just about how long it would take to take off the water.
see their sprung, I guess. Huh? Yeah, they're sprung. Yeah, the oleos, right? And they also are articulating. Uh, and we had a lot of fun with this because uh, what we could do is, uh, you see the toe line right now is not going through the thrust. But what we could do is we could lift up the toe line like that. I mean, get up to pretty high speeds and then just lift the thrust line up like that and take off and then land. So you take off and land. So we're doing a lot of takeoff and landings. State one there the scale. <laughs> Feel your head there. Oh yeah, that's the way the sea dart works. Sure. Found where sea dart. See. Go ahead. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Well, the sea dart, actual sea dart, Converse sea dart, flew with single ski and twin skis, and uh, the twin skis were uh, the original configuration. I think the final configuration, if they'd ever gone into production, they did learn that they could do very well, very well with the single ski. Well, you got to have an articulating thing. You're hitting all that water pretty hard, and it's got to really be absorbed. absorbed. You know, that was one thing wrong with the sea dart. I mean, uh, Sam Shannon, who flew the sea dart, or taxied the sea dart, flew the sea dart the first time, I mean, uh, he almost went blind. The, the, the vibrations were so bad in the cockpit that uh, it was terrible. And then we finally had to do some things to reduce that slightly. And, uh, and finally, the single ski was working out pretty well, and they did Sea State 5 out in the ocean with both twin skis and single ski. It was pretty, pretty rough rides, but uh, yeah. any questions on the great the roar airplane, the, the, the quiet roar? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, it would have changed. It was forward of the CG. The, the gas tank was on the CG, but the, if you put another person in, the CG would have moved forward, yeah. Right. Yeah, Joe? I came, I came in just a few minutes late. Well, we'll start all over here. <laughs> <laughs> what, what was the bright idea that conceived this airplane? What were you, you guys looking for? Well, uh, like I started out saying, uh, and you knew Burt Reigns, I think, as well as anyone. And he was kind of a wild innovator. Yeah. Let's put it that way. A really great guy, uh, but uh, an innovator. He had all kind of great ideas. And so uh, even early in the early days, Joe, you may remember, he had an airplane back in about the 1950s, which never flew. It was a contraption. And then uh, there was Frank McCrary. Frank McCrary? Frank? Is that what it was? McCrary? Frank McCrary? He was, uh, became president when Burt Rain was chairman. He had an airplane, too, that actually flew in 1948. And Doug Kelly flew it once and says, don't fly it again, see? <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, both Frank and, and uh, Bert were very, uh, wanted to build an airplane. And I think Fred Rohr always says, forget about it, see? Don't do it. But they would get on the side of the shop someplace, they built an airplane. Well, of course, by the time we came along in 1970, early 70s, Bert Rain was chairman of the board. and. Frank was president, and and so uh, Bert could do whatever he wanted to. And so then he got a hold of Walt Mooney, was a very close personal friend of mine, and died about three years ago at his desk at Convair, after going back to Convair after Roar. Uh, he became a very, very good friend of Bert Rains, and, and, and they entrusted each other. 
And the reason is, is that when Bert Rain would get in a meeting and talk about some of these ideas, most everybody would say, oh, yeah, 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 that's great, oh, yeah, that's great. And then when they'd walk out, they'd say, Jesus, another <laughs> Either that, either that, or that, the meeting, they'd tell him right out at the beginning, that won't work, Bert. And that would make him madder than heck. And Walt Mooney, Walt Mooney's approach was, and he was this really bright young man, Walt Mooney was, uh, he would say to Bert, well, let me look at this, and I'll get, can I get back with you tomorrow? And Bert would say, well, sure. Well, then Walt would really look at it, and he'd get back with him, and he could convince Bert that some of the things he was thinking about were not practical, or wouldn't work, and so on. So they, be they became like this, and even though Bert Rain would call Walt Mooney, you two-bit model builder, you know, and he'd get mad at him and everything, in fact, I, I went to work there, and in the third week, I almost got fired because I went to Burt Rains and I said, hey, Burt, that jet engine you want to put in this airplane, I have zero confidence in that. And wow, he came down on top of me and he said, there's no such thing as zero confidence. You know, but... Okay, well, Bert wanted to mass produce this airplane, it was a, a two-place airplane. He wanted to compete with the Cessna 152s, but he wanted to mass produce it. That's why it was built on 100% polystyrene foam. And, you know, it, you know, these it, even in 20 years ago, you didn't see polystyrene packing like you see it today. You buy your TV set, you buy your VCR, it's all packed in this nice polystyrene foam in all kind of complex <laughs> shapes. So, you, you know, what you can do with polystyrene is you, you build your very expensive mold and you put a few polystyrene beads in there and you shove the hot steam to it and bango, you got a part. And, we, and uh, uh, what you could do, what we had planned on doing was that you fill this form, this complicated form with pre-preg uh, fiberglass and you put the steam, uh, beads in there and you put the steam to it and you got a part and it's all complete. It's got it's covered already with fiberglass and everything, and we were his idea was to produce the whole airplane this way. Well, we made some parts of the airplane and ran and made a, uh, a very complicated die or form, and we made it and we could make we made a part that was about that big and had some for, uh, shapes to it. it a part of the airplane, like maybe where the wing came into the fuselage and all that, it was complicated shape. And we actually made that, and we, we, we could do that. We could fill that thing with poly, with uh, pre pray put the beads in there, put it in a, uh, put the steam to it, and bingo, we had a part. It, it didn't have to be, it would, didn't have to be sanded or anything, it was done. So our idea was to do that for the whole airplane. And uh, that would have meant a bajillion dollars for the forms, but maybe it would have meant easy production. But, you know, production, I mean, how could you ever build any faster than what Cessna was building airplanes for? And one of the things that, that brought it to a conclusion, not concluding the program, the program came to a conclusion because Rohr finally had to decide to get rid of all of their diversified programs, buses, trains, trams, maglev, you name it, they had everything, and they had to get back to their nacelle business. And, that, and the airplane went out at the same time. Uh, but what, in 1974, the Cessna 152 was selling for $14,000 out of the fact, I mean, from the dealers. And by the time you take off what the dealer was getting, a percentage, what the factory was getting in a percentage, uh, what the wheels cost, what the tires cost, what the engine cost, what the propeller cost, what the aviation cost, a avionics cost, and you finally get on down to the building of the airplane, we came to the conclusion they were building Cessna 152s in 200 man hours. Well, boy, we had a hard time thinking about how we were going to get this thing down to 200 man hours. So that was, uh, you know, we were beginning to realize that it wasn't too practical from that standpoint. And it, it's not a, you know, a Delta Wing is not a practical configuration for a two-place cruising airplane like a Cessna 152. So there were, I say, I learned a lot on this program. <laughs> yeah. What happened to the airplane and those Ah, uh, good question. Uh, well, as soon as the programs were all discarded, I mean, getting rid of the turbine trains and getting rid of the 
the, the WMATA cars and getting and finally selling off all the BART cars and getting rid of all the diversified programs and Aurora going back to their basic product line. Uh, the airplane, most of us left Roar. I left the day after Burt Raines left. And, uh, uh, but one, one of the fellas stayed on, Ken Coward. He was a, a really good structures man involved with, with composites and so on, and new, new, new composites. Anyway, uh, the airplanes just sat at Roar for about two years, uh, just sat in the corner. And what uh, we had hoped for, see, this was now, uh, well, in fact, they sat there longer than that because they were there at the first part of 1980 when we rebuilt the San Diego Aerospace Museum. And what we wanted to do was to put the two flight articles, one flew, one hadn't, put the two flight articles in the museum, have the one flight article that had flown in, in its complete shape, but then take the other flight article and cut it in different places so that people could see the kind of structure that was in this airplane and put those on exhibit in the, in the museum. But boy, uh, Fred Gary, who was uh, that now a chairman of the board of, of, of Roar, said, nope, we ain't gonna do that. Uh, we never had anything to do with an airplane. Don't you understand that? We never had anything to do with trains. We never had anything to do with We're, We are building the cells. That's our business. And so what happened, so what happened was, uh, uh, Believe it or not, the airplanes got chopped up. Uh, they took the wheels off and the tires and the engine and the things like that, put them into the surplus store, and then uh, uh, and the rest of the airplane was all chopped up. What year were that? 74 and 75. And what uh, Roars, it, it, at Roar, all of their presentations were always on 35 millimeter slides, you see. And so uh, this is 20 years later, I can say this now. Uh, and I was kind of, I was Walt Mooney's deputy program manager, so we had two books of slides. Uh, we had, a, and they're identical, identical books of slides. And uh, so when I left there, I left with one book of slides. Because <laughs> <laughs> I knew that 20 years later, I would be speaking to the American Destroyed. Everything was destroyed. All of the files were destroyed. All of the airplanes were destroyed. Everything was destroyed. I noticed on the uh, test airplane, the flute, I noticed that the right hand seat had no pedals. No. No. It could have had pedals. It could have had pedals. We just didn't put them in. Ah. Yeah, it could have had pedals. And also, we had instrumentation sitting on that seat. Uh, you know. So we never flew with two people. If and when. If and when we had that. You would. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? How's our timing? Was well, the prior design I more was involved in the Gwyn Air Car or something? Well, there was a Gwyn Air Car, but it had no relation to this. Well, I thought Roar was. No, no. Uh, the prior design was Roar was involved in No, no. Convert. The Gwyn Air Car, the second version or the later version of the Gwyn Air Car, which was all metal, was, was uh, finished. It started in Nashville and finished in San Diego, and that was another son of a gun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm Jerry Balls, one of the directors of the society. Um, God, I thought you were going to say you're one of the directors of Roar. <laughs> <laughs> And this is 20 years later, we can do that. We never publicized the thing at the beginning because I tell you, one of the reasons is is that if you publicize something early like that, and before you've even flown it or right after you've flown it, you are inundated with requests for drawings and pictures and all this. We didn't want any part of that. Should have sold the right to TV. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you had a question, uh, Bill. What was the uh, recommended approach speed? Uh, you said like a hundred and some. Well, all I can say is that on that first flight, when they had ran into vibration problems at 6,000 feet, we kept reminding him, don't get below 90. Because if he got down slow and couldn't pick up the power, uh, he had it. Because, uh, you know, you get too slow in a Delta wing and get the drag high, and you've had it. And, and we couldn't, and you couldn't, uh, 
nose it down to pick up more speed because you hadn't been to those speeds yet, and so you kind of, you know, you like to walk up close with the pump. Was he wearing a shoe? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, he was wearing a shoe. Anyhow, I think that's about it, and I appreciate it very much, and someday we will document this in the Yeah. Get the engineering flavor in Sure, sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, thanks a lot. I appreciate it very much.